Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 73 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Now, if you listen to the podcast a lot or you've heard it every once in a while, you'll know that my specialty tends to be things like literature, romance, England and friends. I haven't spent a lot of time studying the medieval church. Maybe that's because, you know, I, I had a Sunday school education and I felt like that was enough. Who knows? But I haven't spent a lot of time studying the medieval church. That hasn't been my jam. So I'm one of these people that... I know enough about it, but when it comes to being able to tell one monk from another, that is something that I was never really super clear on, something I had to research for reasons which I will be getting to at the end of the podcast. So we're going to dig into different monastic orders today so that you can kind of tell the difference between them when you are out in, <laughs> out in the world looking at medieval stuff as, as you do. So the monastic tradition started out not in the middle of Europe. It started out in the east where you had the desert fathers. A lot of them are hermits. They're suffering in the name of their faith and really kind of thinking about it and working it out. And a lot of Christianity in the medieval world and kind of how it's evolved since then is based on the stuff that the desert fathers figured out while they were out there. So there's a lot of hermits out in places like Egypt and they're living this holy life and starting to draw people to them. So it's possible, you know, some people say that St. Anthony the Great was the person who first started kind of monastic living as a community in the third century. The first rule that we have for monastic living seems to have come from Pacomius, who's again living in the third century, and he's deliberately started a community of monks. But the first guy who seems to have really been influential is St. Basil, St. Basil the Great of Caesarea and he wrote a rule in the fourth century that the rules that you'll see later on or hear later on in the podcast are based on. So when it comes to monastic rules, Saint Basil is our guy to start with. So let's start with him. He was a guy who believed that it is better to live in a community of like-minded people in a monastic sense rather than be a solitary hermit. So this was kind of a new thing digging into his rule for me because, you know, you, you think about anchorites perhaps being the most spiritual people, the people who are living without anything else, kind of just living on the word of God. So there are a lot of hermits throughout Christian history. I had always thought this was the pinnacle, but <laughs> maybe it's not, well, it's probably not a coincidence that the people who are writing monastic rules think that monastic living is actually the pinnacle of spiritual living. And St. Basil's one of these guys. He says in his rule that it is best to live in a monastic community for a bunch of reasons. One of them being that you can take care of each other. And I like this in terms of a human sense. You take care of each other and everybody's strengths contribute to the whole. But he thinks of it in theological terms. So he's saying it's really hard to be a hermit, basically, because you don't know if you're actually doing it right. And one of the things that he thinks about is that the, well, he says the greatest peril for a person who's living by themselves as a hermit is self-satisfaction. In that you, you're out there, you're a hermit, you're like, I nailed it. I am the best at being a Christian because here I am all by myself fighting temptation. And uh, St. Basil says, well, that is actually a problem in itself. And he says, you need to have other people around you to correct you, to give you the peer pressure you need to live a right life. When you're off by yourself, it's actually pretty easy to let yourself slide. So you want to live in a community. And I'm thinking about this. I do online martial arts and I got to say, when there's a camera looking at me, I work a lot harder than I do if I'm just watching it from a pre-recorded video. So maybe St. Basil's onto something. It's a lot easier to live a holy life or <laughs> to follow the rules if people are watching you, if people are with you. He also thinks it's really important to live as a community because as Christians, he believes that people are called to go into the community to help the community. And he's like, how can you possibly help the community if you're all by yourself? If you're going to help one person, you're not helping another person. Whereas if you live in community, the community can help everybody. So he thinks of it in terms of the body, the spiritual body, which is a really common Christian theme. You know, Christ is the head, everybody else is the limbs, and you need to work together in order to be effective. So that's St. Basil's take on it. 
And the last thing that I thought was really interesting about St. Basil's ideas about why it's better to live in community is that, well, this is a quote from him from a collection of rules, which I will link to in the show notes, but it's regular life, monastic, canonical, and mendicant rules, which is one of the team series. This one is by Douglas J. McMillan and Catherine Smith Fladenmuller. St. Basil asks the important question that I think is... uh, maybe really, really speaks to us in quarantine, especially those of us who have children. He says, how will a person exercise himself in long suffering if no one contradicts his wishes? (laughs) So basically, how can you be a good monk and actually try to not be angry if you don't have people who are making you crazy? (laughs) Which reminds me of that Jean-Paul Sartre quote, hell is other people. (laughs) So I think that's kind of funny where it's like, It's better to live in a monastic community because people will make you crazy. And that's a good thing. It teaches us patience. So the next person or around the same time to have been writing a rule is St. Augustine of Hippo. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on him because he's kind of an entity unto himself. He's one of the church fathers who's like hugely influential, but he did write a rule for men and a rule for women who are living in monastic communities. It's kind of on brand for Augustine to focus on these things, but he focuses on things like pride and also desire. So he's saying if you join a community, a monastic community, and you were rich, that's great. Get rid of all your stuff. Give it to the community. Everyone will own things in common. But don't be proud that you've given all this to the monastery. You should be humble about it. And likewise, if you're poor and you have nothing and you join the community and all of a sudden you have something, he says, don't consider yourself fortunate, (laughs) which is kind of a tall order because I think if you had nothing and you join a community and all of a sudden you have, you know, clothes on your back and food on your table, it would be hard not to consider yourself fortunate. There you go. Also, St. Augustine really focuses on making sure that, you know, women and men are separate, that they are not desiring each other, that they're not making eyes at each other, that kind of thing. But again, St. Augustine, he's a massive entity unto himself, and I'm just going to kind of leave it there. His monastic rules come back again later on, so we'll come back to that. But uh, yeah, it's important enough to know that he did write a rule for women and a rule for men. They're basically the same. So now comes the superstar of monastic writing, and that is St. Benedict, St. Benedict of Nursia. So this is a guy that we don't know a huge amount about. The only things we kind of know about him biographically come from stuff that was written after he had died by Pope Gregory. So it's written through the lens of miracles, but this is the broad strokes of it. And I'm getting this information from the Rule of St. Benedict, the Dumbarton Oaks version of it, which is edited and translated by Bruce L. Bernard. St. Benedict's life, he's an Italian guy. He's born to the north of Rome, so not in Rome proper. And his parents send him to Rome to be educated. And it seems that Frosh Week is a little too much for St. Benedict. He starts to worry that this community of of scholars, of students, is going to corrupt him, and that's not what he wants. So instead, he breaks from the world completely. He's freaked out by he's freaked out by university, and he becomes a hermit. And uh, then he's invited to become an abbot, apparently, which goes okay, except for the fact that the monks try to poison him. <laughs> so he decides not to be an abbot anymore. He heads back out into the wilderness. But he's just too popular and people start to follow him. And so he has a community of followers. He has to corral them some way so that they live a right life, according to him. He founds a monastery in Monte Cassino, which is to the south of Rome for people who are not Italian like me. And he builds it on a former temple of Apollo, which is kind of irrelevant, but I think also cool. So I wanted to share that with you. So Benedict, he's living in the 5th century. He dies in the middle of the 6th century. His rule for monastic living, it is the most popular rule throughout the Middle Ages. It is the foundation of a lot of other people's rules. He based his on St. Basil's and on St. Augustine's. He also has it really closely based on something called the rule of the master, 
uh, we don't know who the master is. There's some speculation that he might be the master. <laughs> Maybe he's just kind of improving on stuff that he's written before. What is beautiful about the rule of St. Benedict and what makes it so popular is the fact that it is very easy to read. It's very short, simple, straight to the point. And he gets at a lot of things that are um, really important to spell out for daily life. So he's saying like, where should people sleep? What should they wear? What should they eat? He gets at all of these things. So it's kind of a complete rule unto itself. And it's simple and easy, like I said, to read. He calls chapter four, the instruments of good works. And I'm going to read a couple of these things to you. And it's from the translation, the team's translation by McMillan and Smith Fladden Muller. The instruments of good works, there's over 70 of them. We have almost the same number of podcast episodes. And it involves the Ten Commandments. So like follow the Ten Commandments. The golden rule is in there. Do unto others. Uh, don't do the seven deadly sins. That's in there too. And then there's a bunch that I think are important to understanding monastic life in general. In that people are undertaking this more seriously than people in the greater community. So 11, for example, is to chastise the body. So this is an important part of monastic life is not to have an easy time physically. And so even though Christians are supposed to kind of be not paying a lot of attention to their physical bodies outside of the monastery, here in the Rule of St. Benedict, he's really saying specifically that you should be very kind to your body, so to chastise the body. But we think of monastic living as being kind of separate from the community, but there are several things in here that if you are familiar with what the job of a monastery in a medieval community is, are going to be kind of familiar to you also. For example, number 14 is to comfort the poor, 15 is to clothe the naked, 16 to visit the sick, 17 to bury the dead, 18 to aid those in trouble, and 19 to comfort the sad. So even though monasteries are meant to be kind of separate communities, it is part of their mandate to take care of people if they come to them, and also to go out if it's necessary to take care of people in the community. So we think of them as being enclosed, and especially when we think of nuns, definitely enclosed, but there is part of their mandate to help the community, kind of specifically outlined in the Rule of St. Benedict. A couple of other ones that are interesting, number 47 is to see death before one daily. So always to think of the afterlife, to monitor one's actions ceaselessly, which is not going to be a surprise if you read the rest of the rule. It's very much about following the rules. Um, 53 is one that I would have trouble with. That, that is not to speak idly, nor so as to cause mirth. So no cracking jokes in St. Benedict's Monastery. I think I would have a hard time with that. I don't know about you. 59 is to despise one's own will. So that is to really give yourself up to what you're being asked to do by the abbot. Uh, and St. Benedict really explains the job of the abbot based on the fact that it's it comes from the word for father. So the role of the abbot is really spelled out there. And so St. Benedict's like, give up your own will, despise your own will, give it up and follow what you're being asked to do. In fact, he makes that more specific in the next point, which is to obey the abbot's commands in all things, even if he strays from his own path, mindful of the Lord's command, what they say, do, but what they do, do not perform. So he's saying obedience is paramount. Obedience is paramount in most monastic orders, but then again, a lot of them are based on the rule of St. Benedict. 64 is an interesting one, especially because there are often fictional representations of monks in which they're very intolerant. But 64 in the Rule of St. Benedict, chapter 4, is to hate no one. So it is not the mandate of monks to be super intolerant. They are not allowed to hate people. Now, this doesn't mean that they're going to approve of everything you do. Like he said earlier, you know, you're always correcting people as well as yourself but they are not meant to be hateful. They're not meant to be intolerant. They're meant to be accepting and to see their own sins as well as everybody else's. And just one last one before we leave chapter four and start to leave the rule of St. Benedict is 71, which is to make peace with an adversary before sundown. So that's kind of reminds me of those signs that people say like, always kiss me goodnight or like never go to bed angry. Well, St. Benedict agrees with you. 
Now, one of the reasons that the rule of St. Benedict was so closely followed or so widely followed, perhaps, is the fact that Charlemagne was one of the people who kind of picked it up and thought this was great and really wanted to make sure that all of the monasteries in the Frankish kingdom were following the rule of St. Benedict. So he really kind of put that in motion, although it was his son, Louis the Pious, but, you know, appropriate title because of this, who really made sure that everybody was kind of following the rule of St. Benedict as a standard for Frankish monastic living. And one of the reasons I really liked the uh, Dunbarton Oaks version of this by Bruce Bernard is that it has the letter to Charlemagne in it where Charlemagne has asked like for more clarification on the rule of St. Benedict. So this has got some really interesting stuff in it where he's getting his questions answered saying, okay, well, here's what we wear. Um, here's the, we've sent you a weight so you can measure how much bread everybody gets. We've sent you a cup so you can measure how much wine everybody gets. St. Benedict says that we all get this many tunics. Here's how we've done that. And so it's a really cool letter that you have that kind of elaborates on the more simple rule of St. Benedict and tells you how it was employed, at least by some monks. And then that was that was spread as much as possible, as much as Louis the Pious could make it possible across the Frankish kingdom, which is one of the reasons that Benedictine rule was so influential later. And I think the last thing that I wanted to say about the Benedictine rule before I move on is that it was really focused on a few things that I think are important when we're kind of sorting out which monks are which. And that is the rule of St. Benedict is really focused on living kind of enclosed in a community with the idea that you did help the community as well. But it was focused on manual labor, on reading, which is really important, resting and praying. So he lays out the times of day during which you should pray and the times of day during which you should work and says, you know, everybody needs to work at something with their hands and everybody needs to put in a few hours a day reading and this is really important when we think about the rise of education, who was in charge of education. These Benedictine houses made sure that everybody spent time reading. And in fact, St. Benedict is like, if you interrupt some people's reading, you should be punished for it, man, because reading is super important. So yeah, totally, totally on board with that, St. Benedict. Oh, yeah, one more thing I wanted to say about the rule of St. Benedict. The Dumbarton Oaks version was published in 2011, and it said that there are currently, at least in 2011, 1,200 Benedictine monasteries globally. So that's kind of interesting. The Benedictine rule is super important, even still today. One of the things I hope to kind of peel apart for you and really make clear was how could you identify a monk from what they were wearing, well, that seems to be actually really difficult because <laughs> St. Benedict never said the color you should wear. He said it should be really simple what you should wear. So that means that you've seen, you'll have seen you see Benedictines in black, sometimes in brown. And then later on, the people who kind of make a more austere version of the Benedictine rule for their communities, the Cistercians, they wear white. And Cistercians are... <sighs> They're hardcore. They're hardcore monks. They really, really follow the rule of St. Benedict kind of to the letter and make their lives very austere. You'll see in some Cistercian abbeys that there's, for example, a warming room where you could go in and warm yourself up, but you couldn't stay there because that would be too sinful. You would feel too good for too long in your body. So Cistercians had a really strict way of living that was really based on the rule of St. Benedict. And those guys pretty much wore white but Benedictines could wear white or black or even brown. Really simple undyed wool. So sorry about that. You can't really be sure that you're looking at a Benedictine just by looking at the color that they're wearing. I was hoping to clear that up for you, but I just can't. There are a group of people called the Grey Friars. If you have been to Edinburgh, you know that there's Grey Friars Bobby. The Grey Friars are the people who follow St. Francis. So let's get to St. Francis now. St. Francis of Assisi is a really cool guy. And unlike St. Benedict, because he was born later, he was born in the 12th century, we actually know a lot more about St. Francis than we do about St. Benedict as a guy. 
a lot of what I know about St. Francis and later we'll talk about St. Dominic, I got from the world of medieval monasticism, its history and forms of life by Gert Melville. And that's a really great book if you're looking for something that gives you a general picture of monasticism kind of broadly in Europe. Melville says in his book that the Franciscan order was in terms, and this is a quote, in terms of sheer numbers, the largest religious order of the Middle Ages. And that's really cool. And there are reasons for that, which we'll get to in a second. So St. Francis, you might know his story already. He was the son of a cloth merchant in Italy, a really rich guy. He apparently was a bit of a ne'er-do-well in his youth. He enjoyed the finer things and he was well-dressed as you would expect the son of a cloth merchant. He did go to war at the age of 20, which was a bad experience for him. He was a prisoner of war for a year and that kind of started to change him a little bit, um, both physically and mentally. He got very ill and he, well, he got mentally ill as well. But he still went to war another time, a little bit later, as a young man. This is kind of what you do. You go to war against other cities in Italy at this time. And he hears the voice of God coming to him in a dream. So he goes back home to Assisi and he starts to live a better life in terms of Christian values of the Middle Ages. He's not as extravagant. He starts to help the people with leprosy in the community. He is praying in kind of a rundown church called uh, San Damiano, and he hears God speak to him again, saying, build me a church. And so he takes this at face value, and he starts to rebuild the church of San Damiano by stealing from his father. <laughs> he also steals from his father in order to feed the poor. This eventually goes badly, and uh, his father imprisons him, hauls him before the Episcopal court, and uh, at that point, this is 1207, Francis is standing in the middle of the court and he's like, you know what, fine. He takes off the clothes that have been given to him by his father, stands there naked and says he's not going to be his father's son anymore. He is going to devote his life to God. And he does. He starts to beg for his food. He starts to preach and people start to follow him in his very humble way of living as people do with these things. And the Benedictine Abbey close by gives the small community of people, which we'll now call Franciscans, gives them a place to stay, kind of home base, and they start to preach. Now, Melville says this important point, and that is the Franciscans were not educated clerics. So these are not people who grew up expecting to be clerics. These are just regular people who are joining because they want to follow this religious life of poverty, chastity, and obedience, the three pillars of Franciscan life. So this is this is really interesting because these people, they didn't follow dogmatic rules. And so it was kind of a tricky thing when Francis went to the Pope and said, can you give my order some legitimacy? They said, we'll see. And eventually they did. So this is around just after 1200 when this is starting to happen. And so by 1218, he's got approval from the Pope that his group is um, legitimate and that people should support them. People should give them the food that they need when they are begging and when they're preaching. So this is, again, it's really interesting because they are allowed to preach, but they're kind of only allowed to preach to get people to give up their sinful ways. They're not really allowed to preach at this time, they're not allowed to preach how you should be living in terms of Catholic dogma. They're just kind of meant to be going around and telling you how to live a better life. And this is really interesting, especially in terms of uh, the Dominicans, which we're going to get to in a second. One interesting note is that around 1218, around the same time, this woman showed up in front of Francis the name Claire and she asked for Francis's help asked for his blessing and he cut off her hair as Melville says in front of the altar and allowed her to start a community near a sissy of women who wanted to follow Francis's ways and so these women were called the poor Claire's and the poor Claire's were also they kind of expanded across Europe as well so groups of women nuns called the poor Claire's you'll see them later in the Middle Ages as well. 
one of the things I think is kind of cool about St. Francis is he was really on fire, a really charismatic guy, and he decided he was going to take his fire to the Holy Land on crusade and try and, well, try and convert, you know, the very top people of the Muslim world. And uh, they basically laughed in his face and sent him home. But, you know, he got there. He was, he was there trying his best. I mean, shoot for the stars, right, St. Francis? Good job. Good job, buddy. Now, Francis, as we know, wanted to live a pretty simple life. That's why he, you know, divested himself of pretty much everything. He died in his hometown. He asked to be laid on the ground naked to die. And he was. He died naked on the ground at the age of 46 in October of 1226. So what do we need to know about Franciscans? Well, Franciscans were mendicant friars for the most part. That means that they traveled around to preach. So they were not... They were mostly not meant to be in a single place, in a single community. They were meant to go out and preach and help people to live a better life. They were not allowed to accept money at all. They were allowed to accept food if it was given to them, if they needed it. But they were absolutely not supposed to possess things in the ways that other monastic communities were or that other church figures were. When you became a monk with a Benedictine house, your possessions, you could donate them to the house and they could be used by everybody. When you joined a Franciscan house or joined the Franciscan order, you were meant to sell all your stuff and give the money away. So it's not the same thing. They were very, very concerned with poverty as kind of fundamental to them. And one of the ways you can spot a Franciscan more easily they were supposed to wear poor clothes. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were supposed to be gray, but they're often wearing gray or brown. And they often have a rope belt with three knots in it that symbolize poverty, chastity, and obedience. And kind of the last thing that I want to mention about St. Francis is you could live as a Franciscan. You could take kind of minor vows. Minor is probably not the right word. You could take some vows and live following St. Francis, a secular life. And there's a rule for that as well. That's called the first rule of the third order. So the first order being Franciscan monks, not Star Wars, Franciscan monks. The second order being the poor clares and the third order being lay members of the community. And those people, again, had to wear a very simple undyed clothing and to help in the community, but they didn't necessarily have to live as friars. And women could be members of this as well as the third order of Franciscans. So St. Francis, really interesting story of the guy himself. And it's kind of a great story for the Franciscans not necessarily being people who were educated to be members of the religious community. I think that's an interesting story. And when you see a Franciscan now in media, you'll know what that means. Then we come to St. Dominic. And I wanted to learn more about St. Dominic because I do know that a lot of the inquisitors in the 14th century, for example, happened to be Dominicans and I was wondering kind of what was what was going on who hurt you Saint Dominic <laughs> what was going on so that he was so interested in persecution for example or at least heresy so I looked into this and again Saint Dominic was born in the 12th century he's really really contemporary with Saint Francis but they're very very different guys and so Saint Dominic he's born in Spain he becomes a canon of the church. So he's gone through, and again, I'm getting a lot of this from Melville's work. He's educated in liberal arts and theology. So he's a canon. He is a clergyman. He goes off and kind of finds his purpose when he goes with his local bishop to Denmark. And he sees that there's a lot of Catharism in Denmark. Catharism is a heresy, so it's not following Catholic doctrine, but it was super, super popular at the time. A lot of people believed in it, and a lot of that was because they were disillusioned with the Catholic Church. They didn't like how things were being done. It's wealth, for example, but a whole bunch of other things, which I don't have time to get into. But basically, what we need to know is Catharism is a heresy. Dominic went to Denmark and saw that there was a lot of it. He and his bishop, who stuck together for a long time, also knew that there was heresy in the Baltic states, and he, they were both really disturbed by that. They asked to be sent to take care of the heresy there. Pope Innocent, who was pope at the time, said, nope, I don't want you to do that. I want you to go to southern France. 
which is a real hotbed of Catharism again. So if you want to learn about Catharists, chances are your studies are going to take you to southern France where it was really, really super popular and entrenched. So Dominic goes there and he starts to find that the only way to really convince Cathars that the Catholic way is the right way is to kind of imitate them. So he really goes with the idea of apostolic poverty. Again, he starts wearing really simple clothes, he and the bishop, and they find this is a way to really get people to hear them in a way that kind of looking like they came from the Pope didn't. So Dominic's trying to fight fire with fire. And unlike St. Francis, he really kind of pushes to have more people follow his idea. And his idea really was that you should have people traveling around, they should be living monastic lives, and that they are very committed to what they're doing, committed to, again, poverty, chastity, obedience. But they should really be focused on preaching. These are kind of church doctors, and they're out there really making sure that people are clear on what the doctrine is, what the dogma is, and that they are following it. The Dominican order is really based from the beginning on fighting heresy. So it makes sense that these are the people that become the inquisitors as the Middle Ages go on. Now, interestingly, Dominic, again, contemporary with Francis, he goes to the Pope just around the time of the Fourth Lateran Council, which is in 1215, and says, hey, can you legitimize my order? And Innocent's like, listen, there's too many orders right now. I'm not legitimizing any of them. So just not now, not now. So <laughs> Dominic doesn't get that legitimacy that Francis does because Francis luckily had snuck in just before Innocent to get this. The Dominicans follow the rule of St. Augustine, Augustine, again, one of the church fathers, really would appeal to someone like Dominic, who had probably studied him for many years. So the Dominicans followed the rule of St. Augustine. They are referred to often as the order of preachers. And again, they are educated. They are really kind of devoted to the rules as they understand them of Christianity. And Melville says by the middle of the 14th century, there were 21,000 Dominicans in Europe, in about 630 communities. Now, they're a mendicant as well. So they're meant to be going out and preaching, but you can see that they did live in communities as well. St. Dominic didn't last as long as St. Francis did. He died in Bologna on August 6th, 1221. So how do you spot a Dominican? Again, there's not really clarity on what they should wear, except that it should be simple. Dominicans, I think most often you see them in black. But again, you often see Benedictines in black. So who are they? Well, if they're in a community kind of close together, reading or writing, they're probably Benedictines. If they are out preaching, they're probably Dominicans. So this is a really quick and dirty overlook. Maybe that's the wrong phrase of who are the different monastic communities. So maybe it would be easier for you to tell them apart or at least understand why people join certain ones and not other ones. I didn't even get into the military orders because I've been talking for a long time. But the military orders were another option for lay people as well to join up, even if they didn't want to be military members of communities. But hopefully now you can tell the difference between a Benedictine, a Franciscan, and a Dominican, at least in terms of what they stood for. Now, there is a reason that I have been digging into monks so much, and I promised that I would tell you about this later on. If you're on my mailing list, you already know this. If you're not on my mailing list, well, here's a surprise. I've been commissioned to write another book. My next book is going to be How to Live Like a Monk, and it's going to be for Abbeville Press. And it's going to be a beautiful book with lots and lots of pictures. And it's going to be telling you a little bit about how living like a monk in certain ways can make our lives better. And I think this is kind of really funny because they they got in touch with me before we all started actually living like monks. So perhaps this book is going to go in a different direction than it would have before coronavirus. But uh, yeah, the next book is going to be How to Live Like a Monk. And that's going to come out sometime next year, the end of next year. So watch out for that. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's new, Peter? 
Hey, hey. Well, uh, there's been a, a discovery of a Viking helmet in England. Uh, it was announced just last week. And the funny thing, it was actually found in the 1950s. It's been kind of like uh, sitting in a, like a local history museum for all of, for decades and decades. But now some new research has kind of gotten covered and says, yes, this is actually something that dates from the 10th century. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> Discovering something in your own backyard. So we've got that. Um, we've got your piece on the five senses of sin, which is very good. I, I really like that. Thank um, you. We've got also Murray Dom has written a piece on Christopher Columbus and how he's depicted in movies. Oddly enough, there's not that many Christopher Columbus movies out there, so. <laughs> I think that's okay. I'm not sure how many Christopher Columbus movies I would want to watch. <laughs> uh, the best one involves Bugs Bunny. <laughs> I think I have seen that. <laughs> All right, Peter, we definitely have to talk about the new level on Patreon because it's super cool and exciting and I'm I'm super stoked about it. So <laughs> I just said stoked. <laughs> What's the new level on Patreon? It's called the, the Maps of the Medieval World. So we've kind of teamed up with Tina Ross and she's been a map maker for me for, for quite a while. And so we're creating uh, kind of brand new maps of various medieval places, like uh, from countries, continents, cities. It's uh, these things that are going to be voted on by our members, our Patreon members. And if you join up at, at the $20 tier, uh, you'll get a new map each month. So uh, we started off with uh, England in 1066, kind of a classic map. Tina's working on that right now, and it looks like our next map will be uh, Africa in the 14th century. We're having a vote on that right now, and uh, people who sign up before the end of August will be able to get that map, a digital version. I'm super excited about this because not only do you get a map, which is these maps are exclusive to our Patreon members, aren't they? They don't get them anywhere else. No, no, that's right. Uh, this is Tina's working uh, just for us. This is a kind of a project. It's something we wanted to do, uh, create these kind of maps, uh, which we think they'd be useful for teaching or if you uh, just want research, we want to put them with a lot of details. So uh, it should be a lot better than you might see on, say, Wikipedia or anything like that. So, yeah, we're really excited about this. Yeah, so not only do you get a map, which you can use for all sorts of things, you know, get it, get it put on your wall or you can use it in the classroom, but you also get a say in what maps come out next. So you can keep voting until you get the map that you want. And I think I definitely can't wait to see this map of Africa in the 14th century. It's going to be awesome. It's so exciting. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm really excited too. <laughs> yeah, so... For all the people who are not on our Patreon yet, you have to go to patreon.com slash medievalists and you have to get on the new tier, right? Please do so. Yeah, your, your Patreons really help support the uh, website, help support the podcast and like everything we're, we're doing here. So yeah, and we're uh, really glad to offer kind of these rewards when you sign up. Oh, one last thing is there is a tier, I think, where you can get Medieval Warfare magazine and the Medieval magazine and the maps too, can't you? That's right, at $35. So that gets you all that. So every month you'll be getting like a, like a ton of stuff, medieval stuff for you. So lots know, of fun. I know, it's going to keep people busy. That's awesome. All right, thanks, Peter, so much. Thanks. For everything from monks to maps, follow Medievalists.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find all my current books, including Life in Medieval Europe, Fact and Fiction, at all your favorite online bookstores. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Guy Frog. Thanks for listening and have yourself an awesome day.